Q4 FY22 earnings conference call. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company, which are based on the beliefs, opinions, and expectations of the company as on date of this call. These statements are not the guarantees of future performance and involves risk and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal the operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. Today on the call we have Mr. Prem Kishan Das Gupta, Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Ishan Gupta, Joint Managing Director, Mr. Samvid Gupta, Joint Managing Director, Mr. Sachin Bhanushali, Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Sandeep Shaw, Chief Financial Officer, and Mr. Manoj Singh, Senior VP, CFS Business. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Prem Kishan Das Gupta. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the post <coughs> results earnings call of Gateway District Parks Limited. Uh, we have uploaded our results press release and presentation on stock exchanges, as well as the company website. I hope you had an opportunity to go through the same. The rail logistics business has performed exceptionally well in FY22 due to various factors. Firstly, during the COVID period, the passenger operations on railway network had come down significantly, which resulted in capacity getting available for rail freight transportation. Secondly, the partial completion of the Western DFC route with around 750 kilometer of the 1100 kilometer operationalized, it has resulted in an improvement in freight train speed, thereby reducing transit time, increased predictability, and better asset use. In addition to these factors, we could increase our market share in the NCR region. The situation at Shanghai port has caused some disruption in supply chain, resulting in some de temporary delays, but expected to get back to normal soon. With this, I will now hand over the floor for questions and answers. Feel free to ask anything, and the entire management is there to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star, then one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star, then two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. We request the participants to limit their questions at two per participant at a time. Should you have more questions, we request you to join back in the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. To ask a question, please press star, then one. The first question is from Sumit Kishore from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Uh, we see a strong uh, margin performance in uh, the rail link ICD business. Uh, is the EBITDA per TU that we saw in Q4 of 10,357 rupees, uh, um, is it sustainable about 10,000 rupees for coming times, or are there factors specific to the quarter which uh, drove uh, this uh, margin performance? Plus, you uh, read recently that railways has withdrawn uh, the uh, discounts on college charges for container movements. Uh, I mean, how is that likely to impact your uh, business uh, um, in, in coming times? That's my first question. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for your interest in the question. Uh, no. First is that uh, uh, on an annualized basis, we look at uh, EBITDA per TEU margin somewhere around 9,000 uh, rupees plus minus 5%. Yeah. So uh, it is greatly dependent on uh, the uh, import export mix as well as 2040 uh, mix uh, as far as our total business is concerned so it is not something which is dependent on a particular quarter 
so from a uh, forward looking uh, uh, guidance point of view i think we should consider it at the same level as 9000 rupees uh, second is that uh, uh, as expected railway has indicated that the discount of 5% the rebate of 5% which was available on laden uh, containers and 25% on empty containers and empty wagons is getting withdrawn laden one will get withdrawn with effect from 1st of may and uh, the empty one will get uh, withdrawn from 1st of august uh, the burden will have to be passed on to the customer because when this, these discounts were given, we had passed on the benefit to the customer and uh, that's why withdrawal would also affect the price. So uh, we'll see an uh, increase in price to compensate for uh, the rebate uh, amount, uh, more or less equivalent amount. Uh, we'll try for a marginal higher increase because our uh, uh, inflationary pressure has also resulted into our costs going up uh, in other uh, uh, element, particularly the fixed cost uh, segment part of it. But we hope that uh, we should be able to pass on the uh, uh, increase in burden on the account of real haulage charges as well as inflation to the customer uh, with effect from 1st of June onwards, if not 1st of May. And we'll be able to maintain our uh, uh, margin at 9,000 rupees continuing over the next uh, financial year. Sure. So basically, you managed about 9485 rupees per TU in FY22. Uh, so that that uh, falls in the um, um, uh, uh, about five percent plus range, right? On on uh, over nine thousand. Uh, one more thing I would like to clarify is that in the last quarter we had an exceptional income of about 12 crores uh, for the acquisition of land by Haryana government at our 30 years through terminal. So uh, this plus some other interest uh, plus interest income. So all that uh, might have added up to per TU if you have oh. converted everything. For the last quarter. Mm. For the last quarter. What, is the, what is the exceptional on interest income? Exception uh, means we have a... He's asking about interest, exceptional interest income. No, not exceptional interest, but uh, we have been accumulating cash uh, in the company. So we have ca cash in hand. So uh, based on that, I mean, uh, we can see uh, the interest income, whatever, you know, I mean, the rates are low, but uh, interest has, uh, income has been uh, accruing uh, all along this year, but uh, also in this uh, queue. Uh, Q4. Sure. That's my second question uh, on the PNL. Uh, so, why has depreciation uh, come down quarter on quarter? Uh, you, I have, you have explained the other income going up. I believe uh, you know, but it's quite a sharp increase. Is there any other item in other income which is causing that uh, increase other than every income? Yes, Basically, depreciation has gone down as compared to last year, last quarter, because mainly because uh, Punjab Conveyor, which we are using, we have mm -hmm. surrendered and this uh, agreement got closed on 31st January. Right. Not surrendered. Oh. I mean, the so basically, agreement got closed yeah. and all that. So, uh, whatever depreciation was there, that has been accounted for till 31st January only. Yeah. So, if you compare with the last quarter, then the depreciation will be little bit lesser in this quarter. So this is, uh, you know, it will be further down QOQ than uh, when the full quarter impact comes in Q1 FY23. In, uh, in, in last quarter three, the, the full year, uh, full quarter impact was there because that is the entire CFR was operational for the entire quarter. But in this quarter, only January month was operational. That's why it's, the figure is, if you compare quarter four with last uh, quarter three, then uh, depreciation for this quarter is lesser. Yeah, that is uh, very clear. Onwards, it will follow the same whatever it is coming on analyze uh, quarter to quarter basis. Whatever we disclose in quarter four, almost in the same line, it will come in Q1 also. Got it. In other income, is there, is there any other one off uh, uh, or is it entirely the uptick is because of the treasury income? Uh, one of income, as Chairman just mentioned, that there was 12 crore of exceptional income which came because of the land acquisition of some of the land parcel by the government. So that's why 12 crore of exceptional income has come in quarter four. So that is part of other income. Okay. Yeah, that is that is that is club in the other income. Okay. I'll, I'll join with you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of 
Krupa Shankar NJ from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Krupa Shankar, your line is unmuted. Okay, we've lost the line for Mr. Krupa Shankar. We take the next question from the line of Jay Shah from Naurang Enterprises. Please go ahead. Oh, I, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, yes, congratulations, Man Man, for a great set of numbers. I just wanted to ask that, you know, nowadays, because the last mile delivery is picking up so much, and a lot of uh, these other transport uh, players are also getting into the uh, rail freight business also. So what advantage does GDL have over, you know, uh, the other guys also that are vying for the same uh, business in a way, uh, especially rail freight that uh, the likes of TCI, TCI, etc. even they are getting into rail transport. So what primarily as a company do we have an advantage over them apart from the DFC? Uh, frankly, I have not understood your question, but uh, I think if you look at the business segment in which we work, as far as overall logistics is concerned, we are into international intermodal segment. And there is no, uh, it's only the 17 intermodal operators which operate in uh, this particular segment. As far as the last mile, I have not heard of any last mile rail transportation uh, play by any other uh, player. But uh, uh, your point is valid that uh, the main uh, differentiator uh, in the international intermodal business is going to come out of dedicated freight corridor advantage, which will have two effects. One is that the asset utilization will improve, and secondly, because of reliability of the supply chain, international supply chain, the uh, costs will go down and there will be a modal shift from road to rail, particularly operating out of Mundra port CFSs by road will get converted to a very large extent by uh, to uh, rail uh, ICDs in northern India. So that's the uh, significant edge that we have over others. Okay, got it. But if you, Just could, one more if you could elaborate on the question that you men mentioned earlier, I'll be able to probably address it better. Sure. So basically what I was asking was, is there uh, uh, any way that the business is being split? For example, I was uh, listening to the TCI Express phone call where they were saying from one end to the other, for example, location A to B, they were also planning to start using the railway network because uh, of, uh, you know, the problems with uh, roads and obviously because of the fuel cost. So everyone's trying to get onto the railway network because they've identified the advantages. So I was uh, wanting to understand that is there any way they would be eating into our share of business or something like that? Uh, no, Jay, actually it will be helpful for us because they will be customers for players like us. Okay, okay, got it. And just one more follow-up question. Uh, how are you seeing the export size and what are major sectors that are, uh, you know, using our services for the export uh, segment, like maybe pharma or is it capital goods or engineering kind of uh, sector? So the way that this business is, it's not, uh, it doesn't differentiate between different segments. Uh, people are using our services, as Sachin was saying, to connect to international markets. And this is one part of the overall journey. So any cargo which, which can be containerized is handled by us. And uh, in terms of the growth which we are seeing on the export side, it's not limited to ICDs. We are seeing it in our CFS business also. So as the volumes of the country are going up for export, then automatically, uh, you know, the number of containerized exports are going up. And a large part of these guys also have imports because their raw materials are imported from abroad. So uh, it's not segment specific. It is more dependent on location, your quality of service. And uh, since we have a network which we can provide to them, which is aligned with the dedicated freight corridor, so uh, that gives us a comparative advantage over many others. Okay, got it. Thank you. This just learn last question I wanted to ask was how is the uh, response by these companies to use the DFPs vis a vis what they previously used to uh, use as the road transport? I mean, are they like willing to give us uh, incremental business from their existing uh, road share? Um, see, the, for them, uh, what matters is the transit time and the frequency of service which a player can provide. So by being on the DFC, uh, both on the transit times, uh, you know, we can offer them better transit times. Plus, we are, again, a network because we have uh, multiple ICDs and they connect to 
the DFC either directly or via each other. So we can provide them cutoffs to the vessels for export, for example. Or uh, when the import arrives, then uh, they don't have to pay detention at the port because we evacuate the containers on time. Uh, I hope yeah. that answers your yes. question. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the answer. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Abhishek Ghosh from DSP Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, sir, just wanted to understand around, we've seen a uh, fair amount of price increase as far as diesel prices are concerned. So how are road uh, freight rates, uh, uh, you know, uh, faring between uh, rail, uh, between the rail freight rates? If you can give us some color, what's the, and is that also translating into better, better model share as far as the rail part of it is concerned? So the trucking rates have gone up uh, significantly. In some cases, the trucking rates have gone up by 25% uh, on the back of uh, increasing fuel prices. But surprisingly, long distance transportation of containers, particularly lightweight containers, has not been affected by the fuel, uh, uh, increase, fuel rate increase at all, which is a little, I would say, uh, uh, irony in the given situation. Uh, there has been no change in rail freight for conventional rail product as well as the container transportation except withdrawal of the 5% uh, rebate which was there on laden rail haulage charges and 25% on empty rail haulage charges. And it will, as I mentioned earlier, it will be passed on to the customer. The dynamics now has actually shifted entirely to transit time uh, from uh, 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 pricing, rate, rail versus road pricing. So uh, going forward, I think the uh, intensification of demand on uh, rail uh, for the rail product will depend on sustainability of the reliable uh, uh, transportation cycle uh, on the back of uh, the DFC. That's number one. Number two, over a period of time, the cost of carrying inventory is going to go down significantly because there was a time when the price competition used to take place. The uh, transit time on rail and uh, rail and road used to be more or less similar. Now the uh, product differentiation is so significant that uh, the possibility of losing a customer from road to rail to road is pro pro probably not there. Uh, going forward, sustainability of dedicated freight corridor based performance of ensuring connection to the vessel or, vessel or evacuation of imports in time is going to be of importance and I think uh, there will be a continuous model shift. There will be a secular trend in model shift from CFS to ICD, particularly the Mundra port uh, uh, based CFSs, which is going to benefit us. Okay, sir, that's helpful. And sir, also if you can just broadly talk, talk about how, uh, because if you look at broadly for you, the growth has been almost to the extent of 16% on a YY basis on rail volume terms. While we don't see a similar number for uh, the overall exim rail movement by the Indian Railways. So what has been the kind of change in market shares for you, if you can just uh, broadly highlight that. Yeah, so uh, we have been able to uh, uh, improve our market share both in NCR as well as maintain it in Punjab uh, markets. So NCR, while the overall market has uh, shown an improvement of just about 15% for the ICD business, we have been able to increase our YOI uh, business by almost about 36%. And uh, in uh, uh, so we we now closer to 16% as far as our market share in NCR is concerned, 15.35, uh, 15.85. As far as Louisiana market is concerned, Louisiana market we continue to be uh, at about 35% uh, of the market, and uh, the market has grown by 18%. We have grown by 20%. And so this is for what period? This is for the entire year, 2022. Okay, okay, not specific to the quarter. No, it is not about quarter. In fact, most of our responses in this conference call are uh, uh, with respect to the year's performance, unless you specifically ask about the quarter. Okay, and so just the other thing in terms of uh, the capital allocation, uh, if you broadly look at the year, your capital allocation, uh, your uh, operating cash flow generation has been very significant uh, and you have brought net debt of about 300 odd crores today. So just two things over there. If I see your balance sheet, 
uh, while you have a gross debt in excess of 500 crores and you have a large amount of cash on your balance sheet so uh, why not just repay it and have a lower size of debt that's one and second is how should one look at the capital allocation strategy from here given that uh, the balance sheet is much more uh, toned down in terms of debt and there is a significant of operating cash flow so how should one look at it as far as the uh, uh, capacity expansion and capex uh, if you can just broadly talk about these two aspects thanks see if you look, look at the debt the, the, it has come down significantly in the last <clears throat> two three years and uh, the cash in the on the balance sheet which we have uh, we have capex plans for that and uh, uh, we have taken a considerate uh, view of uh, the cash flows that are available to us uh, month over month the <clears throat> cash in hand that we have uh, as of now and accordingly you know we divide it over <clears throat> whether to pay dividend or and to invest into capex uh, we might <clears throat> go in for some more loans uh, and going into the future with uh, not for the existing facilities where we uh, incur capex on a regular basis but uh, for the new terminals that we have been uh, uh, you know talking about and we have made some uh, progress on that and uh, so that cash will be used uh, for that purpose rather than reducing the debt now and a uh, couple of months later a few months later you know uh, taking the debt again so uh, that is how we uh, we have a dividend paying policy for more than since the beginning of the company more than 25 30 years so i mean uh, that we will continue to do so we will reduce our debts regularly but we will also have new debts for our new expansions and at the same time use our cash i hope that answers your question yes sir uh, but I just wanted to get an understanding in terms of uh, you mentioned uh, raising more debt to add more terminals so what should be a comfortable net debt to EBITDA which you be comfortable uh, with? Uh, yeah, earlier we used to always give an indication of 2 is to 1, but uh, you know our uh, results have been good, our EBITDA has increased by a lot. Uh, so 1.5 is to 1 net debt to EBITDA is something we're looking at. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thank you so much and I have few more questions. I'll come back in the queue. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from Bharti Savan from Mira Asset. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you. First of all, congratulations for a very good set of numbers. Uh, just wanted one clarification. Bharti, you're not audible. Uh, could you be a little closer to your uh, uh, microphone? Just, yeah, just hold on. Is this better? Yes. Yeah, much yes. better. So, uh, one clarification and couple of questions. So, the clarification that I'm seeking is on the Punjab Conveyor. What is the impact during the quarter? And going forward, what should be the annual um, uh, positive impact on account of Punjab Conveyor no, uh, no longer being uh, uh, our, uh, as a part of uh, GDL? Uh, yes, yeah, so virtually in Q4, Punjab Conveyor wasn't there since uh, our operations were till Jan 31st. Uh, we, you know, we had already given an intimation to customers that uh, we won't be there in the facility and uh, there was no proper plan in place for the new person to take over uh, and still the facility is vacant as of now. Uh, so we did about 5,000 uh, TUs in January in Punjab Conway. So not, uh, not much of an impact over there. Um, and going forward, you know, we have shifted uh, uh, a lot of business uh, and we've gained market share in the Bombay uh, facility in our own CFS. So where we were initially doing say 8,000, 9,000 TUs at our own facility, we're now doing uh, anywhere from 14 to 15,000. Uh, so it's it's not all from Punjab Conway, it's uh, a mix of both. So that that's a net positive for us. While volume might appear to be lower, on a beta basis we'll be better off. But uh, Punjab Conveyor, to my understanding, was a loss-making uh, facility for us. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it was closer to 5 crores a quarter. So uh, we haven't seen any positive impact on the EBITDA per TU for the CFS business. Can you please explain that? No, sir, it wasn't uh, 5 crores per quarter. That was the fees that went to uh, Punjab Conveyor. So in the last year, the fees was about 20 crores because it was based on 
uh, escalations linked to WPI, and since WPI went up, our fees also went up. Uh, so it, it wasn't uh, making much money towards the last year, but it wasn't the figure that you're saying. But uh, can you uh, ideally we should have seen the EBITDA per TU for CFS business improving, given last entire year we have been upwards of 2,000, closer to 2,400 rupees per TU, and our guidance was also closer to 27 to 2,800. Uh, whereas for the quarter we have ended up closer to or less than 2,000 per TU, despite of this facility going off. Uh, so there are actually a lot of other corporate expenses related to the merger and all that were accounted for in the CFS business actually. Uh, so that's why it might be seeming a bit subdued. Uh, also due to uh, overall budget uh, improvements, there's an increase in employee benefit expense uh, because of a higher variable payout. Uh, along with that, there have also been some negotiations by the labor unions over there. Uh, as the tenure gets up, so those costs have increased, and fuel costs has also increased, which has not been passed on fully right now. Um, so th those are the reasons why it's not appearing higher. But we still stay on track for uh, improve. Like, we will definitely improve our margins by working out of one facility, and you'll see that over the next few quarters. Okay. Uh, can you just uh, uh, give the exact uh, quantum, uh, if possible, on the merger-related cost, which are accounted above EBITDA for the CFS business? Uh, don't have that on hand right now, but it's basically, a, uh, you know, the legal advisor costs, the uh, relisting costs, and uh, we had some road shows, uh, things related to that which have come into it. Uh, so we can share those details with you later offline. Sure. Uh, my no, next question is to Sachin. I wanted to understand what is the impact of the global supply chain disruption or uh, shortage of containers to our business given our uh, quarter on quarter exim volumes, not for GTL, but in general at the macro level for Western DFC has been kind of flattish. So what kind of impact are we seeing? And uh, in light of that, what would be your guidance for uh, the next financials and for FI23 in terms of volumes for both the businesses? Okay. So, Bharti, uh, as far as the macro uh, view on the sector is concerned, uh, with the onset of uh, the Ukraine crisis as well as uh, slowing down of the overall uh, uh, international maritime trade on account of closure of many South China seaports, uh, the tonnage has gone down roughly by about 10 to 15 percent. Uh, this has also resulted into quite a few uh, vessels missing call on certain ports, including those in India, resulting into a subdued performance of the imports, particularly uh, in the second fortnight of uh, March 2022, uh, continuing in the first fortnight of Mar uh, April 2022-23. Uh, uh, but we are already seeing firming up of uh, imports, so I don't think it will last long, and uh, we should be able to cover up uh, in the rest of the quarter uh, as far as our import performance is concerned. On the export side, uh, the same is actually resulting into non-availability of bookings. Since there are no sailings in the port, though empty containers are available, uh, bookings are not being offered by the shipping lines uh, as freely as they ordinarily would. So there is some kind of uh, glut as far as uh, empty containers or the exports is concerned, which will start picking up the moment uh, uh, the overall uh, uh, let's say uh, drop in tonnage uh, comes back on account of speeding up once uh, Shanghai and other South China seaport uh, uh, ports start operating as well as uh, uh, the uh, uh, blank calls kind of disappear. So from that point of view, I don't see a major cause of concern at least as of now. The, uh, if we look at the pulse of the market as of now, uh, on a quarter basis, we should be able to uh, remain somewhere around 90 to 95 percent of quarter four, which is normally the case. Quarter four is strong and quarter one is one of the weaker quarters. So we would look at similar numbers going forward uh, uh, in the current year, unless, of course, situation doesn't improve and, and, and the maritime trade continues to suffer at the hands of uh, 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 slow movement of supply chain, which doesn't seem to be the case, though. So, uh, so far, uh, as we start off this financial year, this may not have a significant impact on the overall volumes uh, unless things worsen up. But is That's container right. availability a concern? 
as an or no, not at all. In fact, now there are adequate containers available. Container bookings are not taking place. So there is an in, empty inventory which is available in the port towns, as well as empty inventory which is available in the uh, hinterland, which can sustain uh, uh, an export level of uh, uh, the uh, uh, to match the demand from the trade. So uh, container availability is no more an issue. There are some pockets though, uh, as far as overall uh, maritime market is concerned. In some of the ports, there is an imbalance, but that can be corrected over a period of time by shifting empty containers from one port to the other port, which shipping lines keep on doing often. Understood, understood. Uh, next, I wanted to understand on the status of BSC, uh, what is the likelihood of uh, the entire stretch commissioning by June 23? which is the stated guidelines, uh, has the last leg or as in the land acquisition related issues uh, pertaining to the last leg of DFC, that is connectivity to JNPT, has that been resolved? Okay, so June 2023 doesn't seem to be a possibility at all. Though there is a little bit of opacity as far as information from uh, official sources is concerned. But on the basis of our uh, uh, reconnaissance done in the market and the pulse that we get from uh, various uh, sources, uh, best case scenario, March 20, December 2023, which is also very unlikely, but we are hoping that December 2023 or maybe uh, 2024, uh, FY 2024, should see dedicated freight corridor segment between Palanpur, Makarpura, Makarpura, uh, Navasheva should become operational. Uh, there has been no positive information about uh, removal of the obstacle of uh, the non-availability of about 5% of land on the linear project. Uh, and and that's, why, that's why there is an uncertainty there. Understood, understood. Uh, lastly, on the CAPEX front, uh, can you guide us through what will be the absolute CAPEX for each of these businesses over next two years? Uh, yes, so uh, we have this in our investor presentation also. Uh, we are looking at two terminals, uh, rail link terminals, at a cost of around 60 crores each. Uh, and then after that, we'll be uh, also spending on uh, equipment and vehicles, uh, along with maintenance capex uh, and building of warehouses at our existing facilities. So total capex, all both verticals put together, will come to about 200 crores over the next two, three years. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. We would request participants to please limit your questions to two per participant. For any further questions, you may come back for the follow-up. The next question is from the line of Bhumika from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, sir, and congratulations on a good set of numbers. Um, sir, you spoke about that, you know, this quarter, the 10,000 plus EBITDA per TU for rail has been driven by an improved mix of volumes towards import, export, 20, 40 feet mix, etc. Um, you know, and given that the withdrawal of the haulage charges will largely be passed on, so that should not be an issue. But, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, restricts us to, you know, see some more expansion from this 9,000 to say maybe a 9,500, 9,700, etc. Um, you know, is this mix something which is very difficult to sustain? And you can just talk about that a little more, especially given that rail mode share that you mentioned is only rising now. Okay, Bhumika, aapke muh mein ghee shakkar, but uh, if wishes were horses, pigs would fly. Uh, it's not very easy to improve margins at that level consistently. And uh, as Mr. Gupta mentioned earlier, uh, the quarter four number is also, uh, uh, has got a little bump uh, on account of the extraordinary income which arose out of uh, compulsory acquisition of land, a small parcel of land at Gadi Arsaru by Haryana state government for the construction of a road project and compensation that we got on account of that. We consistently continue to be uh, uh, currently at the level of about 9,000 uh, to 9,500 uh, depending on the quarter and the, uh, the way we measure it. Uh, on a steady state basis, uh, uh, we expect that we should be able to maintain this by taking an uh, increase in our uh, uh, price to the customer to take care of the uh, increased burden on rail haulage charges with withdrawal of these uh, rebate. Got it. Sir, uh, you know, how would have the double stack improved versus last year? Because I would think that, uh, you know, that would be the key area of improvement in the margin profile that we've seen over the last 12-18 months. So if you can just give some color on that, 
and given uh, and you know how is virangam's uh, kind of scaling up because that would act as a key further driver of improvement in the double stack index for us okay so uh, we continue to be at about 35 38% uh, in the last quarter we have been a little low. we are about to 35% but the annual number is 38% as far as double stack index is concerned that means uh, out of the total 40 feet containers we were able to carry 38% of our containers on the second stack it's also on account of heavy weight uh, double, uh, 40 feet containers cannot be carried on the uh, second tier uh, our overall savings primarily has helped us in maintaining our margin at the same level. This year has not been significantly uh, different from the previous year as far as uh, uh, number of containers as well as monetary uh, value of uh, the savings on account of uh, double stack operation. Uh, however, the 40 feet component in the overall uh, business has gone up and that has helped us a little bit during the current year. But primarily it has been on account of the overall commercial strategy that we have been able to improve our margins as compared to last year as well as the nominal EBITDA has gone up. Understood, sir. And just the Viramgam number, I mean, how is that scaling up in terms of the scale up? Because that would also help in terms of so improving Viramgam, the... Our, our, uh, our hub and spoke operations out of Viramgam has actually paid us uh, uh, very good dividends in terms of uh, savings of rolling stock as well as a reduction in uh, unit haulage uh, cost, particularly for our Navasheva business. Our imbalance cost would have been much higher. So just to give you an idea, our uh, underframe cost last year was about 7 crore rupees this year it's about 5 crore rupees uh, it has gone down by 2 crore rupees and uh, in addition to that some ad additional double stack benefit is has been available for navasheva business as well as pipa business because we operated out of uh, viramgam viramgam originating business has been a, a cause of concern uh, the reason for that is that the shipping lines are not willing to open new locations particularly on the back of the COVID-related uh, restrictions. And they, in fact, they are trying to consolidate their business to a fewer number of ICDs than spread them around in uh, multiple ICDs. But we're still on to it, and we expect that this year we will see some watershed in terms of improvement in volumes. So inflection point probably should occur in 2023, FY 2023, as far as originating business of Ahmedabad uh, area is concerned. Oh, got it, sir. Got it. I'll come back in the question queue for more questions. Wishing you all the best, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Vumika. Thank you. The next question is from Ashish Shah from Centrum Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, can you just give a little more detail about this land acquisition gain we mentioned uh, for the Gari? So, what was the total quantum and what was the gain we made there? So the total area acquired was about two acres uh, out of the 90 acres that we have, 990. So it is not significant uh, piece of land that uh, that is gone. And as okay. per the government acquisition policy, I mean uh, they pay you know x number of times the market uh, the circle rate. So our land at Gadi was purchased uh, 15 years back. So I mean the uh, the gain that we made. Uh, and our books was to the order of 12 crores. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, secondly, uh, if you can describe the overall competitive landscape in the Ludhiana market, there, uh, you know, at the start of Q4, uh, we, we were kind of indicating that competitive uh, scenario has kind of increased. Uh, levels have increased because of the restart of the Adani terminal. So, can just talk a little bit more about the volumes, market share, and pricing pressures there, if at all? Okay, so uh, Ashish, currently the Ludhiana market is in a steady state. Uh, we haven't seen much uh, dynamic uh, dynamics there in terms of competitive pressure. But our anticipation is that quarter one, quarter two of FY 2023 is going to be uh, the uh, the period of action, and there would be a possibility of uh, compression of margins there to some extent. Though we have taken a price increase last year, so we have been able to bump up our margin per TU basis as well as overall performance of Ludhiana Terminal in the last year. This year, it is likely to be under pressure. It's very difficult to quantify it at this stage because it depends on the aggression of the uh, competition in the market as well as the overall demand because if there is enough demand in the market and if it is more than what uh, all of us can pro provide to the customers, then the price pressure would not be as severe as it would be if the demand drops. So currently, I, I would say the situation is a little fluid. For us also, it would, it would need maybe another couple of months experience to comment upon it. 
Sure. So lastly, just more of clarification. You know, we we have done well in the NCR market. Our growth rate is high. In, in Ludhiana, we have done well. But when one looks at the uh, Indian rail uh, data, for exam uh, loading, uh, that seems to have grown by barely uh, maybe a two percent or so. So uh, why so much discrepancy? Uh, what if if you can just help us uh, with that? Okay, so the methodology which is used by Indian Railways to arrive at that data is uh, a little skewed. So they uh, take data of TUs from number of TUs or, or the throughput of the sector from us and multiply it by 14, uh, which is not necessarily the average uh, uh, tonnage per uh, container. And uh, the uh, uh, the average tonnage per container actually deteriorates further if 40 feet container composition in import and export increases. So I won't consider that to be a reliable data. Uh, so if you look at overall data, the uh, uh, port side business has seen say about four and a half to five percent growth. MTs have grown. Risto also has grown. Risto is basically transshipment which does not come either into hinterland or CFS. But as far as the ICD business is, grow, uh, is concerned, I think the overall ICD business across India has grown roughly by about eight to nine percent. Northern India segment in which we operate of Faridabad and Gurgaon terminal has grown by 15 percent. I, uh, by mistake, I mentioned it 18 earlier, but it is actually 15 percent. And we have been able to grow at uh, uh, 32 percent uh, in that market, uh, which is which means that we have been able to uh, do very well as far as acquisition of market share in NCR market is concerned. Got it. Sir. And so this growth rate you are saying is for Q4, right? Or for FY22? Uh, no, I am talking about FY22. FY22. Okay, sir. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from Abhijit Mitra from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, and congrats on a great set of numbers. Um, just to sort of, uh, you know, uh, probe a bit more regarding the NCR market share. Actually, it's, it's quite phenomenal when we see that there are almost 15 players, including yours, as in, uh, you know, are present with their ICDs in that market. Um, so so when you are gaining at 30%, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, you must be seeing someone losing uh, market share significantly. At the same time, you are quite com confident that you'd be able to pass on, you know, the repairs which has been removed by railways to the customer. So, so what is sort of giving this confidence? Is there distress in the market or uh, you see some competitors gradually moving out or not being able to sort of uh, uh, play the game in the level which you are playing? So uh, some some clarity on that. And same for Ludhiana. I think while you're, main, when you're maintaining increased competition, but you're at the same time confident that you can pass it on, as in, you know, pass the price on to the customers, which I'm believing is also... Uh, you know, depend on the fact on what your your competitors also do, right? So, so some thoughts on that, yeah. Okay, so Abhijit, uh, normally the way you increase your market share is not necessarily by taking away the entire business from other uh, operators. Most of the time, what happens is that the new customers which are being added, which are shifting either from CFS to ICD business, or those who are uh, 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 setting up, let's say, new capacities in this market, they uh, try you out and you gain your market share primarily from that it is not necessary it is basically the growth and new business which contributes to your market share easily rather than uh, taking away business from others taking away from business and from others almost always results into a reaction from the customer reaction from the service provider to match whatever you are offering both in terms of service as well as in terms of pricing that's the first part of it second part of it is that we have followed the commercial philosophy of creating adequate infrastructure as well as capacity on the rolling stock side, uh, movement side, so that we are superior in terms of our frequency as well as evacuation of containers or connection of export containers to the vessel, designated vessel. So it's basically on-time performance, uh, which is kind of we work always work on. This has helped us a lot. This has helped us in both import direction as well as export direction. And we have been able to intensify this with the freight express scheme which, were, which came in, which resulted into a short transit time being guaranteed by Indian Railways to us. And within the cluster of terminals, our uh, assured transit times are the best in class. 
not only that, we have actually been able to provide a performance which is better than the assured transit time. So just to give you an idea, we have a 36 hours, 42, 48 hours and 52 hours for Navasheva, Mundra port and Pepawa port as far as Gadi terminal is concerned. But we have been able to maintain 36 hours for Navasheva. We have been able to uh, improve uh, the uh, 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 Mundra port times to a uh, time to as low as 32 hours on an average basis, best ever as 27 hours. And Pipawa, instead of it being 52 hours, we have been able to do it all, almost always less than uh, 48 hours. So this creates a good amount of confidence in the minds of uh, customers. Similarly, another thing which happens is that because of competitive price which is being offered by others, there are many times when customers do test waters by shifting some part of their volume to the competition. But when the service is not as good as the service which is being provided by us, which comprises of timely evacuation, customs clearance uh, facilitation, as well as storage whenever bonded storage is required to be done at the terminal. So all this put together, the offering that we have is definitely superior that's the reason why i think the uh, uh, the customers stick to us it's like the the test of the pudding is in eating it and uh, since, since we they find our services to be superior to those of others we have not only been able to maintain our share but also increase our share in the market okay great uh, so this assured service uh, performance or assured transit time performance that you are getting because of the scheme which indian railways have uh, you know started this benefit is going to sort of spread as uh, uh, DFC stabilizes or this benefit is going to stay with you? Um, I think it will intensify further uh, with the dedicated freight corridor getting commissioned up to Palanpur. Uh, almost unofficially it is com uh, commissioned up to Palanpur. And with the feeder routes to Navasha, uh, to P Mundra port and Pipawa port also getting intensified, I think reliability of operating out of these two ports uh, for northern India terminals, particularly those who are directly on dedicated freight corridor like us, I think the benefit will intensify going further going uh, going ahead okay great thanks that's all from my side thanks Ashish. thank you the next question is from aditya mungia from kotak securities please go ahead uh, good afternoon everybody and congratulations for the good side of numbers uh, my first question uh, relates to this advantage of transit time and i think uh, um, there's a very valid claim that you make that you have uh, uh, you are the fastest to move out of NCR to the port, so the transit time is the lowest. Post DFC, uh, does that competitive advantage uh, change in any manner, whether it gets diluted or remains the same? Uh, so, from a dedicated freight corridor point of view, the dedicated freight corridor which can help Mundra port and Pipa port is already there. Operationally, it is already there. So uh, uh, there is going to be only improvement as far as uh, transit time on dedicated freight corridor and the rest of the network is concerned. So I don't see any reason why it will get diluted for either for us or it, it will improve for others and not for us. So going forward, I think the benefit is going to stay, number one. Number two is that those who operate more number of services will be able to offer better services. And I think we are heads and shoulders above others as far as our frequency of services as well as on-time performance is concerned. And that's the reason why this uh, uh, this benefit, as I mentioned earlier, will not only stay but will further intensify. Okay. Again, I just want to kind of clarify a bit on this point more. See, I had gone to, uh, let's say, another competing terminal, and what I got to know was that um, in terminals beyond that of Concord, um, a double stack train actually goes ahead of the ICD and then comes back as a single stack inside the ICD. And uh, Concor uh, will have terminals on the ICD and will not see this thing happening. I have not understood what you said, sorry. So, so the question that I'm ask, going to ask you is that, would it so happen that uh, because Concor's terminals are on the DSC, the double stack train comes directly to Concor in your case, it will not be the case and it will go further ahead of the ICD and come back as single stack to your ICD? Is, is, is that notion right or wrong? No, it is wrong. No, I mean, okay. it is not a notion. I think this is something totally wrong. Yes. <laughs> if you go back to the inaugural train, which was uh, flagged off by the Honorable Prime Minister, it comprised of two trains. One train from uh, uh, Katuas and one train from Gadi Arsaru. And it was a double stack train which originated from Gadi Arsaru and went all the way up to Mundra port. And it was a double stack train. Uh, so double stack doesn't become single stack on account of dedicated freight corridor at all. Dedicated freight corridor is an additional capacity over the congested segment between Atelier and Palanpur. 
it does not affect double stack operations of any terminal which is already on double stack map. In fact, we've been doing double stack since 2011 out of Gadi. Understood. Uh, that clarifies. Um, uh, the second question that I had was, see, uh, 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 you, you've gained meaningfully uh, uh, as, as rail operators uh, from modal shift that may have happened this year. You talked about NCR market growing about 15% and the port volumes growing about 5%. What I'm trying to get a sense of is that this differential that is benefiting you, this model shift that is happening, let's say in FY22, can this growth com uh, contribution be even higher next year? Or should we assume a similar kind of growth kicker coming in for model shift or incremental model shift in next year itself also? Uh, Aditya, I think there, there should be some distinction which should be made between market share and model shift. Okay. We have no, no mechanism to measure the model shift. But as far as the market uh, share is concerned, uh, NCR ICD market has grown by 15%, whereas the overall port markets has grown grown by, let's say, 5%. It is about 4.8%, so 5%. So the reason for this is not modal shift. In all probability, the reason for this is that the manufacturing activity in India is actually getting better traction than commodity market, and that's why interland locations, which are known to be manufacturing locations, have seen a better growth as compared to the port side uh, uh, business, which is almost always uh, comprises of uh, uh, commodities. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is our market share growth has been primarily on the back of uh, uh, frequency of service, uh, regularity of service, as well as on-time performance, particularly in export direction, uh, we have been able to scale up in the export direction. That has also helped us in reducing our imbalance, which results into improvement in our margins because that compresses our uh, operating cost metrics in such a way that we are able to generate uh, a better per TU margin. And this is something which is specific only to an operator. It is not a benefit which becomes available to everyone. So it's a complex play which, which has resulted into this. Going forward, I think the uh, benefit of uh, uh, dedicated freight corridor, as I mentioned earlier, will intensify. That's number one. Number two is that modal shift will take place, but it will be gradual. And we will see it over a period of, let's say, next two years, three years, because uh, c getting connected to Navasheva is also going to help us uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, increase in ICD business because of modal shift. And the third part of it is that our market uh, share will depend on how well, how nimbly we are able to address new uh, market as well as growth market which is coming up, which until now we have demonstrated that we are able to do it better than others. So we hope that we continue our performance going forward as well. Okay, uh, understood. Uh, my, my, my next question was, was more strategic in nature. See, some of your peers, let's say Adani Post, um, are able to offer an end-to-end -end service which, which starts with ports um, um, and ends with the ICT and they do the rail in between also. Uh, do you see customers uh, starting to prefer that kind of an end-to-end -end service? And from that perspective, do you want to do more than what you are doing as a value add for the customer? Uh, so let's look at it, uh, Aditya, from a customer point of view. Customer is port as well as root agnostic as long as it does not cost him more. So choice of coming through a port primarily is dependent on the price, the overall transportation price, that is A plus B, ocean plus intermodal price that the customer has to pay. Uh, so uh, an end-to-end -end value chain can be considered to be an end-to-end -end value chain only if only if we take into account uh, the uh, ocean side of it as well as the intermodal side of it. I would not be able to comment upon the, uh, the, the kind of offers which the competition has been offering in the market. But I think our numbers, both in terms of volume as well as in terms of margins that we generate and overall profitability of the business is concerned. I think uh, in the past also we demonstrated that we are better off as compared to others and will continue to be uh, maintaining that lead. And we are quite, uh, I would say, uh, sensitive and uh, 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 alive to the fact that other value additions into business may result into competitive pressure. So we keep our ears to the ground to ensure that we also are uh, ahead of the curve as far as any new innovation in the market is concerned. In fact, we always led the innovation in the market. Okay, so the only concern that I have, and probably end with this, is that you, let's say, maybe making 9,000 rupees per TU on the entire rail plus ICT journey as an EBITDA. 
and someone else who is doing n2 and maybe making 2x of that and then that someone else has a bigger chance of probably offering some discount i would like to know who is, who is the 2x who is making uh, uh, no, the one the one who can do who is making 2x margins i'm not saying just in real but question, I yeah think. i don't think i don't think it's a real question okay okay fair uh, those were my questions um, thanks a lot for your response and all the very best to you sir thank you thank you the next question is from abhishek n from bnk securities please go ahead yeah i just two bookkeeping question so the tax adjustment of uh, 20 crores or that relates to the merger exercise is it yeah basically if we see our result at all hello can you hear me yeah Yes, yes, sir. Again, basically, yes. that if you see the tax adjustment of 22 crore, which is coming in the result, because of the merger and all that, earlier we have made this standalone provision for both the separate entities for Gateway District Park Limited and Gateway Rail Freight Limited. And once this merger order will be received from the NCLT, then we have given the effect of the same of the NCLT order. We have filed the combined return of the entity and this 22 crore. Uh, adjustment which is coming as a positive for the company as a refund is because of that okay so so what tax rate should i build in going forward in fy 2324 you build it mat rate that is 17.47% for the coming years okay we'll okay, keep, keep on paying mat because we have a tia right now till 2627 so uh, till 2627 we'll keep on paying mat and whatever mat credit will be available that will be used for in the subsequent year post 2627 Okay, that's that's useful. And employee expenses, I see a you know fairly big jump from around I think 150 or to one. Actually, already mentioned in the call, there was some provision made for the very well pay and other expenses and all that for in this quarter. But if you see the overall employee expenses for the entire year, the last year it was almost 67 crore and this time it is 65 crore. Okay, so more or less the same run rate for the year. Okay. That's that's useful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Next question is from Harsha from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, hi. My question has been answered. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Pawan from Renaissance Portfolio Management. Please go ahead. Uh, hi sir. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Hello. Yeah, you are quite Hello. audible. Yes, sir. So, sir, just one question. Um, so, over a longer period, say, take a two-three year view, uh, it appears uh, our industry has got several tailwinds in terms of uh, DSC, India signing FTAs, BLI, etc., etc. So, where do you see your this three and a three three lakh thirty thousand odd uh, TU volume that you do over the next two, three, four years? Uh, if you could provide some uh, long-term guidance, vision, that would be helpful. Thank you. uh it can be very difficult to answer this question because it is more like crystal ball gazing and knowing what is going to happen in next 2 years or 3 years but uh, if we look at let's say a purely guidance from a point of view and if we look at gdp growth say around 8 to 9% as it has been predicted and supported by the uh, imf numbers as well i think a low double digit growth is something which is going to be uh, easily achievable but in addition to that i think uh, our intensification of both uh, services as well as presence in the market when we come out with uh, two new terminals uh, which are quite actively i think uh, um, uh, in the process of closure so uh, with 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 both these things uh, we should be able to grow at more than the anticipated rate of this sector which would be let's say lower uh, double digit so mid of teens or let's say higher teens is what i would look at from an overall growth point of view with a condition with a caveat that the gdp growth has to be the the main stay of uh, uh, the uh, intermodal sector as such 